but now to kind of kick it off um i wanted to kind of open up and talk about some of the market conditions i've been seeing myself now feel free to throw uh the questions in the chat uh but so q1 uh was was rough uh of this year so that's from you know jan to to march uh what we saw was we, we had the banking crisis um you know third large or second largest collapse in history uh silicon valley bank and then a lot of banks followed and what happened was volume which carries the market was was quite literally sucked out of the, out of the market why is that bad well when volume is sucked out of the market it creates less and less opportunities for us traders because if there's less volume and less traders buying and selling that's not going to push stocks up nearly as far as it normally should or would um, so that's why in my opinion i thought we saw a lackluster in volume there were some other reasons um just basically the economy in general really wasn't in a great state um if, if we're being honest just with you, you know you name it um and so already we had kind of not the best opportunities. Now, what changed April 1st? Well, I think the banking crisis really cooled off. Uh, and you guys have to understand that trading is cyclical in every market cyclical. Money flows from large caps down to mid caps down to small caps. And we're starting to see some of that large cap money funnel its way down to the small cap side. And after small caps, it generally, generally just has a, a decent reset. Um, and small caps is what I focus on. Now, the reason I focus on the small cap market is because as the funnel gets closer and closer and closer, it becomes less competitive. So less the further it goes down. The reason why that's good is there's less market makers, there's less algos, it, and it makes it easier to catch the, an emotional aspect of trading that trading can cause. Because as traders, all we're trying to do is erase emotion from trading and just think like a robot as to what works and what doesn't. Understanding probability of these setups. In the small cap market, because so many beginners love trading it, just due to the reward it can have, you know, they see top. Right, you know, I'll show you guys top. And it's hard to not get FOMO just looking at the chart. Um, I mean, going from lows of six dollars all the way up to what three hundred dollars almost. A lot of traders love seeing that, um, and that just draws in a younger audience, a, a immature trading audience. And it's easy to capitalize on that. It is just being honest. Um, so I think what we're going to start seeing is as you know stocks like. CXAI, which I actually profited on, you know, went from a dollar to seventy in two days, uh, and then we had top go from six to three hundred. I mean, these stocks are going parabolic, and par parabolic momentum draws in new volume, which is great. We saw this in the GME AMC era, where there was a flood of new traders. Obviously, that was um, inflated even more, mainly because of stimulus check money. Everyone had money to trade. Okay, so what do I expect? I expect I'm going to start sizing up on my positions. You're going to see me trading, you know, between 50 to 100k positions on average. Well, lately I've been doing like 15k to 30k. Um, as the market continues to heat up, I'm simply just going to increase position size. Why is that? Well, there's more opportunities. Win percentage is higher, so I want to step up to the plate when it's time. Also, we, I have to understand that times like this is where traders make their money. In the year 2019, 80% of my trading profits came from uh, end of October, so mid mid October um, to late December. So quite literally, like 60 to 90 days, 80% of my profit came from. That's crazy. Why? Because there's so much opportunity in those few months. So I think unlike most summers, this summer is going to be a hot market. Um, we're already seeing that going into May. So May and June 
Uh, hopefully it trickles into July. I think usually speaking, a hot, like a really hot market lasts for three months, but I honestly, I think we're just starting. Um, so, I mean, we're going to probably see the next 90 days of just opportunity, which makes me excited so I can start sizing up. Um, now one second, I'm going to retry my face cam. Give me just a minute guys. Yes, it works. Cool, cool. Okay. So let me just do that so you don't, this camera doesn't block me. Whew. Thank the Lord. Thought I broke it. So that's kind of where I see the market headed in um, the near future, meaning you're going to see my winners be bigger. You're also going to see my losers be bigger. Okay. That's just the reality of a hot market. So my biggest loser so far this year was about 6,000. My biggest winner was I had a 34 and a 40,000. I'm sure you're gonna see me lose five figures in a day. My max loss will go up from 5K to 10K. My daily goal will probably go up to 2K and steadily increase. I had a week back um, last year, There was the market was just so hot. Um, my daily goal was 10,000. Just there's just so much opportunity. So I am gonna be trading longer um, trading pre-market early in the morning, um, after hours. I mean, it's a grind. Don't don't get me don't get me wrong. Every trader would love to tell you, you know, I could sit here uh, an hour to, to two hours a day, uh, every day the entire year. Well, that's been great. Now I'm starting to understand I'm missing opportunities. Um, so I have to really hone it in. I have to stay disciplined, and because of that, I should in turn uh, make more money. That doesn't mean I overtrade. There's there's a fine line between those two things, and a lot of beginners can struggle with that. Now I'm gonna go into um, you know some of the questions you guys have, and then I'm, as uh, there's a, a lull in some questions, I will fill it with some prerequisite questions I have. Um, to rev can you just describe the best ways to review historical data and how that process helps you today? So um, there used to be an on-demand feature, or there still is, on Thinkorswim. I didn't mind that, uh, but it only went back like 90 days. Um, after that it was deleted. So historical data, uh, for me is, um, it, it really depends on what you're looking for. If it's for, um, swing trades, I mean, that's great. You can go back a year, two years time frame. Uh, if you're looking at like certain plays that used to work out in other markets, that can be harder to do. You have to watch old trading highlights. Um, I used to screenshot everything. So it depends on what you're looking for. And then I could kind of help you more. Um, if I'm using Lightspeed to execute my order, should I keep using TOS or Hammer for my graphs or do everything in Lightspeed as well? What do you focus on the most? Uh, so first question, that is up for you to decide. Uh, for me, I'm still using Hammer's charts. I just, I'm obsessed with their level two. Um, Thinkorswim's pretty good as well. Um, let me pull. I, I love this level two for, for a multitude of reasons and I, I don't need to tell you exactly why all the time, but I, I like Hammer's charts. I, I really spent a lot of time perfecting them. I'm going to give Lightspeed a shot. I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Lightspeed yet. I honestly haven't given it enough time. However, I do know um, a lot of traders 
that I know personally that are on Lightspeed have, and, and it's not uncommon to have a different charting software. It's also not uncommon to have two different trading softwares, especially if you're shorting for short fees. Now I think Lightspeed will, and for, and until another uh, broker steps up, I don't think there'll be cheaper short locates other than Lightspeed. Um, so it's up to you, it's per personal preference. I'm going to create two setups for you guys. One, using uh, Lightspeed's charts. So if your computer can't handle two different softwares, that's fine. Um, and if you like it, you like it. If not, if you're like, man, I'm, I'm a TOS snob. I love TOS charts. Hey, I get it. I traded on TOS for five years. I love their charts. Um, but I am not a super fan of their level twos. So that's just kind of, you take the good with the bad. You can try out light speeds. Like I said, I'm going to make two different setups and then you can ultimately decide what's best for you. Um, what do you focus on most when using level two? I mean, can, can I say all of it? It's it's not, uh, there's so much information there. I, I don't think there's like a more important thing. Uh, when I'm long, I'm looking for both buyers. Either I can size up if there's buyers coming in uh, or I can hold out and may have more aggressive price targets. Say at, I'm buying a stock at, um, what did I trade today? Uh, A G A G B A Agba, right? Was it A G B A? A G B A. Yeah, it was, it was Agba here. Am I, am I, I have to reset my trading software. Apparently it's not updating. Um, so I traded this break right here, this, this VWAP break, um, and the whole dollar break of $4. When I, before I entered, I saw a ton of buying pressure. And then my thought was like, okay, if it dips below four, I can add again, um, four move higher. Now I didn't dip below four and I actually added, I'll show you the highlight cause I got it on recording. I added at 410. Reason being is there's a ton of buying pressure coming in at 410 uh, that I, I knew the odds of it actually dipping were less likely. So I stepped up to the plate, it made me more confident that I was gonna get stuck in the next haul going up. And then I use it for exits as well. It's, you can't, you can't say there's a good and bad part of, of, of a level two. It's, it's the most important indicator you will have in trading, hands down. I, I honestly think I could probably be a profitable trader without charts and just using level two. If I could, if I had to just use charts or just use level two, I probably would stick to level two. Um, and just try to look up charts in my head, I guess. Um, that would be pretty hard, but I didn't really turn the corner of profitability until I really started using level two. Yes, chart setups are great, but then I started to understand like, man, like why, why is my win percentage like 50%? Like how are traders making money? I'm trading great setups, I have good risk management and all this good risk reward, but I'm like, why are my, why is my win percentage 50%? And I started to understand there's so much more happening behind the scenes that I don't really know about. And I could know if I'd learned how to read the L2. It's just, it's the, it's the flow of the stock. It, it will, t it'll tell you more about a stock than a chart will. Um, for learning the stock or for learning a new strategy. Um, so usually I don't, um, try to pick up on a new strategy unless there's an, a, pattern I've been seeing a lot recently. Like I don't actively just look at charts usually um, and be like, okay, let me let me make a new strategy here. Uh, what I've done in the past is I've noticed, okay, this is happening over and over and over and over again. There's something to it here. And what is it? Um, and then I just look back at the past few trades I've taken. It more, the, the, the closer to current time frame, the better. Uh, if you're looking at Three years ago, uh, it can be really hard because markets just change a lot. Like if I was trying to create the dip and rip now, it just wouldn't work. So um, my answer to you is is actively trade these. Um, and then the patterns you start to identify, like I think I saw that yesterday or the day before. Look at recent data. I wouldn't really go out of like the six month to one year time frame for day trading. Um, and that's how, that's how I would do it, if that, if that kind of makes sense. And just have a software that lets you go back that far um, on the five-minute time frame and just continually to understand, okay, that's where I identified the setup. Now can I build a strategy around this? So hopefully that helps.
Ooh, yes. Oh, man, that's going to get me in trouble. I'm going to have to wait. But don't eat it, please. Thank you. The wife and I got Filipino food, and that is my absolute. It, it's right near our house, and it's so good. I love it, I love it. So I'll go through some prerequisite questions that I have while you guys are uh, coming up with some more stuff, more questions. Okay. Oh, it smells so good. Discipline. So, um, Valerie, I'm going to, I'm going to rip through some of these questions because I think they're good. When it comes to risk management, let's go real quick. When it comes to just risk management, discuss how the main trader manages in their risk in their trade, including setting stop loss orders or position sizing. Now, when it comes to managing your risk, you have really two options. There's the physical and then there's the mental. Do What do I use? I use mental now because I have enough discipline if you do not, if if you are not a disciplined disciplined trader at all, you have to use a physical stop loss. Okay. Now, what is a physical stop loss? And this is why Lightspeed is great for undisciplined traders because Thinkorswim will not allow you to do this. Um, the physical stop loss is okay. You know, let me use some other colors. I don't like seeing too much red. Now, you know, say the stock gaps up, you're you're playing the first five minute pullback. Okay. So you buy it right at that breakout level. And then it starts to re reverse and you understand, okay, my price target is this circle up here. Say for, you know, this is $1 price target is 110. Now two, two to one risk ratio, you should be stopping out at this low here at say 95 cents. Now, in this case, if you are a trader and listen up, if this sounds like you, then you need to use a physical stop loss. You buy then it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. And then you go from green to break even, which is gener generally when I'm stopping out. I don't mind stopping out at break even. I have a lot of break even trades. But then it hits your stop loss. But then you're like, you, you know, maybe, it, maybe I should move it down in case it bounces, right? And then you move down a little bit. And then it doesn't bounce. And then you're like, well, now I'm you know risking a lot. Maybe I should either add or just to see where it goes. You know, I, I'm going to risk a little bit more here. No, no, no. You have to use the physical. This is you. You have to actually put in a actual stop order right at this price target. And if it hits it, boom, you're out. It's, it's, it's a tested strategy. If you, if you have poor risk management and you have poor mental game when it comes to trading, use the physical, please. Okay. Can we just agree on that? Um, and I'll tell you why I don't use it anymore. Well, first of all, the way I trade is, is fast. It's, I trade fast. And putting in a stop loss like that can be time consuming. It really can. Because, you know, then I have to go create my order, type in where I want to put stop out. And by that time, I could have already stopped out or added to a position. And I'm really worried about my, my, my physical stop loss. It takes a lot of time. Now, as you get better, I like a mental stop loss. So I, I go, okay, I know I'm stopping out here. So before I even enter, I already know where my... my um, if the worst case scenario, get this, if the worst case scenario, it goes here, I'm stopping out mentally. Boom. If it's a market order, that's fine. Now, this is where you can start to turn the corner on having your losses be smaller. Losses smaller? Question mark. Is the mental stop loss can actually help with this. If you understand the probability of a trade or set up you're taking, okay, and it gaps up, pulls on back, gaps up again, and it doesn't quite hit your first price target, and you see a big seller step in right here, right before your first price target, you can stop out there, or you understand, okay, this is my average right here. I don't, I don't mind breaking even. I'm only risking profit, and then boom. I can already, I can already do it. If you had a physical stop, you'd have to, you have to drag it up, and it's, it's just really, and then click accept, and it's really time consuming. However, if you do not have good mental game, 
do not use a, uh, um, a mental stop loss. Now, um, there's other things to help manage said risk. Like I said, breaking even, um, you know, a, a big, a big seller steps in. There's a lot of things that you can do really, um, to mitigate risk, to manage risk. Um, averaging out is a form of risk management, even for profit. Averaging out for profit is a form of risk management because if you are telling me, you have to understand the more aggressive, we use the same five minute pullback setup, the more aggressive your price targets are, say, I bought at $1, I'm shooting for 150 The more aggressive your price targets are and the bigger the move has to happen within your trade, the, I don't want to say this, the, First of all, the, the lower probability it's going to happen. Um, and yeah, it's just plain simple. It's just less probability, less percent that this play is actually going to work out for you. The reason I say that is if you if the stock has to make a 50% jump, and that's what you're estimating based off the setup, um, the odds of that happening are going to dwindle. Now, if you average out, okay, and I take my first price target at 110, 110 and then 125 and then I take my last sell at 150 now what I did there was yeah back end my, my last price target was 150 but I managed risk and I still locked in profits here and here and here so if it topped out at 149 and didn't fit my whole sell order I still profited what's gonna happen is your winners are gonna be smaller if this happens to you because if you're a YOLO trader your winners are gonna be smaller but you're going to be way more consistent. And consistency wins in trading every single time. Okay, You don't need home run trades. You just need base hits. I shoot for 1% a day on average. And if you compound that over a year and a half's time, it's 20,000% gain due to the compounding principle. It's amazing. Are you fundamental or technical? And we all read the news to watch out for events, but what do you rely on solely? Can you explain your trading strategy while you enter and exit? So, I mean, I can I can touch on that. That's like a whole, I can probably do three hours minimum on that um, or a whole lot more time. Um, so fundamental or technical? Uh, technical, I am. I am a technical trader. So the setup has to look good. I've traded stocks. I, I'm trying to remember some of the wild catalysts I've traded in the past. Um, I think Frankie and I traded a really weird one that were like, that was stupid. Like it looked good, but we probably should have dove deeper into it. Um, I've traded a penny stock that skyrocketed. It was a shrimp, a shrimp, like the, a, a fish farm um, that just found a, a new hatching site or something like that. And it ripped like 200%. Now was the catalyst good enough for the stock to rip 200%? No, it was just a heavily shorted stock that gained a decent amount of volume and just, broke out and gave traders opportunity to buy it in long and higher. It, it, it really wasn't that good of a catalyst. I, I can just, I can, I wish I remembered some of the dumbest catalysts I've traded. Frankie Bryan has a list of some of them. Um, but for me, not that the catalyst doesn't matter because I really do look at it. Like for example, if a stock is at $8 and it gaps up to 10 and the, um, the news, the headline is, um, Berkshire Hath Hathaway gave a an eleven dollar price target. Am I gonna trade that? No, because I know the ceiling is eleven, and it's not gonna go past that. If it's, hey, this biotech just came out with an FDA approval for the drug in their pipeline. Yeah, I'm trading that. That's a really good catalyst. So, I can be both. However, I'm not gonna look even if if the catalyst says FDA breaking news. Their their drug in their pipeline had a hundred percent success rate of of curing breast cancer just an amazing catalyst and it goes up five percent i'm not going to trade it it's not in my wheelhouse you know i, I have parameters it needs to be up generally 20 percent or more sometimes i can you know work with that it's got to be a small cap so usually sub you know 10 million share float and it needs to have at least 250k shares of volume um you guys can't see that last part, a volume. So, you know, those are those are my parameters, so to speak. Um, I've really thought about this 250K one and thought about increasing it to almost half a million. Excuse me, because there's some times where, I mean, it's just, 
it, it really depends on what the float is. If it's like a 1 million share float, I'll trade it. If it's like a 10 million share float and has 100,000 shares, I'm not, I'm not trading it. Um, so, and then, can I explain your trading strategy? Why enter and exit? Um, so, I'm a breakout trader. And more importantly, I like to trade retests. Um, and to explain that a little bit further, so stock forms a pre-market high, pulls on back, starts to break out. It's very common for a stock to break out, pull on back, people end up stopping out, then it curls um, much higher, and then usually that's what I'm buying for, for the retest. So that's more complete confirmation of a break. It's going to continue higher. After that, I size up, and my price targets and why I exit relies on um, psychological levels. So the half dollar levels, the whole dollar levels. So if I'm trading a stock from for the 250 break, I'm selling a little bit at 275, and then for push up to three. If it breaks through three, maybe you'll get like a 310. Um, it, it's 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 every trade's different depending on um, what I see the level two as. But usually, uh, I have a PDF I can share with you guys on price targets for breakouts. Uh, because if I'm trading a 50 dollar stock, which is unlikely, I usually stay sub 20 um even say i'm trading a 20 dollar stock um if i buy at 20 my first price target more than likely won't be at 20 25 it'll probably be more like 20 50 so i increase my price targets accordingly um hopefully that helped answer some of your questions if you want to maybe dial in some of the questions and ask more specifically i can definitely help so what is float what is float good question float is the shares available to trade for publicly trade or for the what's the okay float is the supply of shares to trade so the way i explain this and i have a whole video on it i like to explain it if you guys are crypto guys i like to use like it made a lot more sense to me when I traded crypto and I understood liquidity pools. And I don't want to go off on a tangent on that. But the float is, in simple terms, the supply. So what that means is if there's, if it's a 10 million share float, there's generally 10 million shares exchanging hands. Now there's the long-term investors. Say of the 10 million share float, there's you know 5 million long-term. You know There's 2 million short. I don't know that. Um, I generally don't know that to, unless I do a deep enough research. I, I don't know like who's long-term investing, but generally the lower the float or the lower the supply, less demand is needed for the price to increase. For example, if a stock, okay, think of it as this, the more rare, <sighs> Of a better example than loaves of bread. Um, okay, say there's um, a really fancy pair of shoes that just dropped, and there's and they're doing a bid off, or even better, I like cars. I don't like cars. Say you're at a um, a car show and they're bidding off cars, and then you see in the in the um, the lot there are there's one car. In this example, that people are going to be, this is the just the worst car I've ever driven. There's one car that everyone loves. It's some Shelby, blah 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 blah, blah. and there's a t there's like ten people that really want that Shelby. What's going to happen when when the bid off happens? If there's only one, price is going to increase dramatically, very quickly, because there's ten traders or um, car investors, car enthusiasts that are trying to buy that one specific car. Now, what do you think is going to happen if there's three of those in that parking lot well you know the next one will be might not be as expensive there's more of a demand or there's more of a supply of cars if you only have one and you have 10 investors they're all going to be bidding that that car way higher if there's three of those cars it's going to be easier and the car price is not going to be as inflated same thing with trading so if a stock has a 1 billion share float, like, uh, that's an N, 1 billion share float, like an Apple or something like that, 
there's so much supply, there needs to be a catastrophic amount of demand in order to increase price. The new iPhone came, comes out, um, you know, earnings reports great, and there's $15 billion invested in that $1 trillion company. That's gonna increase it maybe a percent or two. Could you imagine what would happen if there was a 1 million share float stock that you know maybe had a market cap of, I don't know, 100 million, and there was 15 million or 15 billion dollars of buying pressure. What's going to happen to that stock? It's going to absolutely skyrocket. So the float is simply put the supply. In the less float, the more volatile the stock is. And I can show you examples of that. This is why I don't like trading nano float. Nano float is sub. So a nano float is is the smallest. Uh, category of float. Nano float for me is sub. Um, so it's sub 1 million. So below sub 1 million share float is kind of risky. Why? Because there's such limited supply. What you're going to see is um, there's going to be, generally speaking, more slippage if there's you know not a ton of volume. Um, and it's gonna be way more volatile because I mean the supply is going is so limited. It's trading hands so quickly. You'll see a stock, you know, um, go from top. So TLP that went from six up to, um, to three hundred was a one million. It was like one point two million share float, and I would have traded it. Um, but the reason it was able to make that move was because there was such limited supply. If there was a hundred, if it was a hundred million share float, it wouldn't have made nearly that size of a move. So that's why I like to have requirements on the float. Um, there was a stock D or sort of the D. Um, ding, 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 ding. I didn't trade it at a 500,000 share float uh, two weeks ago. I didn't trade it and it faked out like crazy because if you think about it, if there's only 500,000 shares and there's one massive seller, like decent sized seller, I mean, that stock's going to plummet, right? It's just it, one seller can throw off. It. Honestly, and I hate to be that guy, but we can. F there's there's groups that do this, and, and PC will never do this. But our group is big enough to where if we just targeted one small float stock and we all bought, you know, accordingly at the same time, we can make a, you know, dramatic move in, in that stock. If we all were like, all right, team, let's all buy Apple today. It's it's you're not going to see a difference. Point zero 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 one percent difference. It maybe if we all bought. So that's just, that's float for you. How do you find flow? I don't think I've ever seen TOS. So TOS might not provide flow information. I don't think it is. You can look it up on like um, Yahoo Finance or on Finviz. I have my Trade Ideas scanner. I, I can look up. Uh, look it up on Trade Ideas, and Trade Ideas Scanner is very accurate. Uh, but you can look up Flow in a lot of other websites before trading. I think Finviz and, and Yahoo Finance, I think other websites called it. It'll show you the float. Good questions. Keep them coming. Okay, so. Um, Personal experiences and insights. Hear about the main trader's own journey, including successes, failures, and what they learned along the way. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I have a pretty interesting journey. Um, do I have any videos on how to trade retests? I have, yeah, I have tons. I can, I can pull some. Um, so. I mean, my experience has been, I don't want to say, I mean, obviously probably abnormal. So my little cousin um, came to my house yesterday. She wants to do some financial planning. She wants to uh, make a little bit more money. And uh, I, I'm talking to her. Now, let's just say her name's Kelsey in this example. I was talking to her um, and I said, Kelsey, you have to be royally obsessed with trading if you want it to work. I, I genuinely do. I think 
you have to be royally obsessed with with trading in order to make it work. And the reason I say that is because if you just take a look at my journey, and I don't think my journey is too abnormal. Um, so my journey in trading, at, my, at, at 14, I was able to buy my first house. It was an owner finance deal, no money down. Um, you know, I didn't use the bank. I owner financed it. And then when I was 17 in college, I graduated a year early from from um, high school. I, I mean, I loved trading. I love the idea of trading. Uh, when I was 16, I tried to do the drop shipping stuff because I watched a video, how to make money online anywhere in the world. Because my whole goal was if I can make $100 a day, back then $100 got you somewhere a day, um, online just for a few hours of work, and I could live and I could travel the world. That was my goal. That's been my goal for since day one. I can show you videos of me saying that six, seven years ago. Now, I, I, I looked up a ton of videos and I looked up how to trade. And when I was 16 and 17, I practiced a lot. Um, and so when I, when I was 17, my house burnt down. Um, it burnt to a crisp. I didn't really understand insurance at the time. My dad called me when I was in college and uh, I made like, 50 to 150 bucks a month maybe in rent and in college 150 bucks a month was it went pretty far um and i'm like geez dude i got no income coming in um and my dad's like well you know i don't know how much we owe in the house but hopefully you might get some insurance money um now they came back and said oh you know you got sixteen thousand in equity in it and my my dad Thankfully, he was overlooking because I was about to say, oh, okay. You know, I was more money I ever touched ever. Um, he was like, well, I think you have a little bit more of that. The, com the comps, the insurance agency, because insurance agencies that can be scams, uh, are pretty bad, bad comps. So we came back and, and um, they ended up giving me twenty twenty three thousand. 23000 Now, between this time of ha having twenty three k. Um, to that, I had a 3K account. I started with 2,000, and then I added another 1,000. So I was about 3K all in when I was in college. And I traded every day when I was 17. Um, and I was able to grow the 3K account to, I think it was like 5K uh, within a few months. And percent gain-wise, that's pretty good, especially when you're first starting. So I started to see, I mean, I, I have videos of me trading in college. I remember I made $500 on Tickle. tickle. Ticker symbol L E E uh, made 500 bucks. I have the screenshot to prove it. All my roommates were were dead asleep. It was 10. It was really early. It was 10:30 in the morning. Um, and I remember them coming into my room around noon, and just like I had it up 500 dollars, and they were, they were all hooked for the day. Um, M Y O was a big loss for me. Now what ended up happening was, you know, I I traded 3K, but I understood PDT rule at this point. Um, I can actually tell you my first few trades. Uh, I, I have them all written down right next to me. Um, I'll show you. So first few trades, you can see they were, um, the, uh, I traded ETF pairs. Um, and the crazy thing is this day, um, after my third day trade, I realized what real time data was. I was still trading on 20 minute delay. <laughs> so, um, that, that was kind of funny. Cause I remember I was green on this trade and I closed it out. I'm like, what the frick, man, I'm red. And it was 20 minute delay. Um, so you can just start to see my journey of five, a $5 winner. I remember that. I remember, oh, I could buy a cup of coffee with that or my buddy's donut. Uh, and then I started to get into momentum trading. I, INPX was kind of like my first momentum trade. Um, actually plum up here, uh, made a hundred dollars. Um, and then you can start to understand that I realized there was power in small cap trading. Um, now you can see all these wins and losers, uh, on ba basically you can see all my trades here. My first few trades, Lee right here. It was the 20, uh, it was January 29th, 2018. Uh, no, yeah, some, something like that. And I made five, $474, 72 cents. So at that point, I was hooked. Um, now, when I got the 23K, I understood that you needed 25K to trade. That was after about a year and a half of trading. And I put it all in my trading account. Now, um, I started to see early success. Really, I mean, that's just how everyone does. So I remember I the BioNano, the, the genome therapy um, 
sector really was hot and I started to understand what sympathy momentum was. And what sympathy momentum is, is there's one stock in a particular sector that just goes parabolic. And then just because that one stock does, traders try to find stocks in that same niche um, that they can buy in hopes of that also doing the same thing. So CRISPR Therapeutics, C-R-S-P, was a large cap stock that that went like 100% gain in like a month. Um, and then I started to look at uh, other genome stocks and genome therapy stocks that were smaller in flow and market cap that I could think could make a potential big move. So I found this one called BNGO, Bio Nano Genomics. Um, and when I saw that sympathy momentum was happening, I think it went from like $2 up to five. Um, and then uh, what ended up happening was by the time I hit five, I was buying and six, I was buying heavily for a push up to 10. Um, and I was telling all my, my best friends, you need to buy this stock. I, it's funny. I have a text from my best man. So my groom, so my wedding, like, dude, I love you. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not gay, but I love you. Um, but, uh, like, thank you for giving me the tips or something like that. And so what ended up happening was I used that full account plus leverage. I was pretty, uh, over leveraged and that 25 K account went to about, to about 85 K in about two weeks. Um, at that point, I made more money than I ever have ever in my entire life in about two weeks. Um, that was huge, really huge for me. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. And this is why I say you need to be obsessed with trading because this, is, this isn't abnormal. Growing an account when you first start because you're you know, super risky, you don't know what you're doing, and you just you get your first few wins, you think, you're, you, you think it's the easiest thing to do. This is where the obsession kicks in because this happened in a matter of about 14 days. Now, that 85K account, 85K, went down to 14K in less time, in 10 days. I blew it. I blew my first account, literally. I blew it. Um, this was on multiple stocks. Um, I think the bigger one was, it was, I think it's now called Purple. I think they got bought out, but it was formerly known as K. T O V. It was a stock. It's uh, they changed their name. Uh, I held on to it too long. Um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't sell or I could sell, but I didn't. Um, it was a one dollar stock. Ended up going down to about. It did a bunch of reverse splits. Basically, it went down to about fifteen cents uh, from about. I bought it one one dollar and thirty cents, and basically my value is about fifteen cents after a reverse split. Um, and that's my trading story. And I, thankfully, even though I was making this money, I didn't quit my job. I, I loved my job. I was working at a marina. Um, I uh, loved working out in the water. I loved talking to rich people. And I, I learned the power of networking. Um, I made pretty good money at the marina. Now, when I got back home from college, um, my parents started to see a substance abuse problem within my life. And it was destroying a lot of aspects of my life. And the one aspect it wasn't destroying was how much money I was making trading because that 14 K account, I really locked in and I grew that thing. Like it in the matter of like the next three months, it just went straight back up way past 85 K. Um, and this is where I started to get a little ahead of myself was throwing big parties. I had my own crib. I was 18. Um, you know, big, big parties. And I would, you know, trust me, I would not let anyone know. And there was one specific day that my mother walked in uh, early to, she lived a few minutes down the road from my, from my crib on the water. Um, and she walked into my house to give me breakfast and just surprised me, you know, her, her hardworking son making a lot of money. And there was drugs and alcohol just everywhere. And there was like five guys passed out on the couch and it was a terrible sight. Now, my mother and my, my father are split. Um, and it's never a good sign when my mom calls my dad. <laughs> and so she called my dad because she knew I, she, I wouldn't listen to her. Um, and my dad's a you know military guy, very strict, love my dad. Um, basically said, you better get to my office in, in, in 15 minutes or I wouldn't want to be you. And I had a sports car at the time. Um, 
And his, I was on my way to my girlfriend's, now my wife. Thank the Lord she stayed with me. Um, don't know why. <laughs> uh, but that office was 25 minutes away. So I was going fast. And I made it about 16 minutes. I was going about 90. Um, and at that point, um, I had probably six figures in my account. And this is where the obsession kicked in. Because I had a lot of money. I was making a lot of money. And... My dad, um, best thing that ever happened in my life, he took all my money. Took it all. He said, give me your trading accounts. I'm taking everything. You're not doing this anymore uh, or for the time being. And he, and he forced me to work construction about 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, at this time, I was building profit chasers. So I was trying to build a business uh, as well as trade. And when I worked 60 to 80 hours a week and, and still worked out uh, and was building a business, I had... No time to trade because I was at a job site at 6.30, 7 a.m. And I didn't leave it till 6.37 p.m. And I'd go work out. Um, so, but I, the best thing for me was I stayed studying. At night, I'd go to my office. Thankfully, my dad let me share an office with him. I had a little desk there. Uh, some of my trading highlights, you can hear them in the background years ago. He actually traded with me and made a ton of money. Uh, but then he realized my account was growing faster than him. So he's like, why don't you just do it? Um... And what ended up happening was at night I would just go study what what, what happened, where would I have traded, uh, what would I have done. Uh, and the on demand the on demand feature is great. I, I'd practice what I would have done. Um, so my skills stayed sharp. And then after about a year doing that, um, he gave me my account back, and I was able to go you know on with the races. I got fired from all, all my other jobs, um, my marina job which I loved. They found out too. Um, and that's just my story of trading. And so since then, I, I he, he he sent me down at a diner a Sunday morning. And he said, you know, listen, I, I I could see you have a passion for this because he had to, uh, you know, I, I'm a believer in Christ. And I my family believes in not working on Sundays. And Saturday and Sunday, I was at my office working all day, um, all day. No one saw me. And I would wake up. I'd, go, I'd probably work till midnight, and I'd wake up at 5 or 6 in the morning terrible for your health. I probably averaged four or five hours of sleep for a year. Um, and then that's where the obsession really kicked in. Uh, like I said, because I still wanted to do it so bad more than anything uh, in the world. This is even after losing 85 K, uh, blowing my account, um, after it completely crushing my life, um, because I let it, I still had a royal obsession. This is what I want to do, but I have to do this right. And I have, this is my last shot at it. Literally my last shot. Cause if I blow this account, I got to go back to work in construction. At that time, I hated it. Hated every minute of it. The crew was terrible. Uh, they treated me like crap. Because they, they knew I was only there for discipline. And I wasn't as seasoned veteran as they were. And I didn't have. Uh, I probably had nicer tools than they did. And yeah, I was 18 and they were 30-something. I had all the, the good tools. Um, so I understood this is my last shot at doing this for my life. Or... I, there's, I have nothing else. I dropped out of college. I couldn't get a job. I had nothing else. So I'm like, you know what? This is this is me. I'm going all in. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So that's a training story. I understood that um, there need to be an immense amount of risk management uh, within within that. And then I was able to go. Um, I, I traded on live on TikTok. Many of you probably watched me. Traded live for free on TikTok. People watch me do it. Um, I'm that crazy kid that made six figures in a day on Donald Trump's media stock. Um, and then several 50 K and 80 K days after that, um, grossing, oh, 300 something thousand in a matter of a few weeks doing it all live for free, um, with a crappy chair. I mean, my chair is still over there. I have a nice chair now. Um, and a really crappy computer. It'd take about 30 minutes to boot up. And that's just kind of my story, and I just was royally obsessed. Now, where is that obsession now? Oh, it's still here. It's 9 p.m. on a Friday night, and I'm in here. And I'm guessing you guys are probably just as uh, just as obsessed with uh, with trading as I am. I have a plethora of books. I'm still buying books. On the weekends, I'm still watching my competitors' courses. More importantly, so I could go, okay, that was a, that's a crappy course. I can outdo that. Uh, that's really what people are paying for. But also, there's some valuable information on that. I learned a lot on the short side uh, over the past few years. A lot. Um, 
So, you know, that's just kind of um, how I did it. And, and the obsession just still is to this day. I always want to get better at trading. I'm always looking at my trading highlights. I'm always trying to figure out how I can become a better trader. Now I've understood the short side of things is vitally important. I need to be a better short trader if I want to make more money. If I knew how to short back then, I definitely would have netted way more than a million dollars in trading. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, zero down my mind. But that's just kind of my... Uh, my, my trading journey. Sorry, I was long-winded, but um, hooked you like a drug. Yeah, literally. Full port back in the day? Absolutely, man. That's all I did. That's all I did. That's all I did. I blew about, I went from 85K back down to 14,000 in 10 days. Um, so, she did save me. I, yeah, about 90% of you, 99% of you um, probably found me on TikTok too. Thankfully, that platform um, led me to a lot of you guys. Uh, question, what's the, what's the best way to manage risk? Uh, sorry, if, if your message got deleted, you probably used the word N-I-G-H-T, night. For some reason, our, our um, auto mod bot likes to just um, delete that. What's the best way to manage risk when there's a giant push up with a sudden turnaround? Uh, spam, just just based off of the question you're asking, I think um, you should understand a strategy a little bit more. Um, my question to you is: So, are you buying just because there's a gigantic, you know, move to the upside? Um, you know, I I would challenge you to see what I guess your your strategy is. Um, now, in my opinion, best way to manage risk. Especially if if a stock hit your first price target, and we already went over it. I don't. Um, I recorded this, and you can go back to watching it. Best way is if this is your average and it hit your first price target. Best thing to do is move your stop loss to break even. Best thing I can recommend. So, um, and going back to my cousin, the reason why I said you got to be obsessed, girl, with trading is because that's how I got here, and I don't think you can jump any more hoops than I did, um, or any less hoops. Obviously, I can teach you, like. Uh, like crazy, I probably can teach you. I, I mean, our guarantees I can teach you in 12 months. I think I could do that. But um, that is personally, if if you are not obsessed with it and you don't think you will be because you don't like numbers and you don't look, like looking at charts, girl, I got other methods for you to make money. Trading might not be for you. Trading is not something you can you can half-ass, guys. It's not. It's you got to go all in. So, on YouTube channel about Benji videos, awesome. I got some awesome content on the YouTube coming out. We haven't really focused YouTube over the years just because it's not been our growing platform. Um, but I love making YouTube videos because I have so many funny ones saved I just haven't posted. I'll, actually, in fact, 90% of my YouTube videos are private for the PC team. So if you guys aren't part of the PC team and you want all the high-class videos that are high production just like this, I go over my strategy and go over method and I show you actual um, trading highlights, just know PC team gets it all. Cryptocurrency trading. Um, so this is this is a question I get a lot. Uh, Jason, why don't you trade crypto? And the in the short answer is I tried it. I actually did um, for a short amount of time. Um, for example, um, in the hot market, it was about from May to or from April, late March to to end of May in 2019. Um, I was trading crypto, um, around the time I had that Corvette there, um, balling out in Miami, I made a lot of money on crypto, but I lost a lot too. Um, the, th the problem with crypto is it's not regulated. It's not, um, th the three main problems with trading crypto is regulation, liquidity, and fees slash slippage which kind of goes back to lack of liquidity these three reasons are why i do not trade crypto and i do not think you should either i think trading crypto if a guy tells you he makes a bunch of money trading crypto i'd be careful i'd be really careful um unless it's a bull run and you're getting lucky on some altcoins day trading crypto like i do uh stocks is not something you're gonna want to do um and I can, I can go in and, out, in and on and on about that, but I would mention, please do not. I, I wouldn't try trading crypto just from those three reasons. 
how much um how much do I risk per trade? It depends. It really depends on what setup I'm trading. Is it an A plus setup? Is it a hot market? I use I use a whole hundred K if I have to. Generally my starter positions are twenty five percent of my overall account and then my main position is about fifty percent total. Um so I I mean I'm I'm day trading with with over half of my account generally speaking. Well, like I so for reference guys, I, I usually keep my account zero to a hundred thousand and then at the end of the month I have to either add more money into it or take money out of it. Um I had a point where I had three hundred thousand in the account and I was day trading in it. Um I actually just sent a wire over to my Lightspeed today um, because I'm going to be increasing that account size. As because there's there was times where I put 350k in, in one trade before I, I've done it before, um, and in this hot market that we're about to experience, I'm going to do it again. Trades breakouts like small like warrior trading. So um, I get that question asked a lot. Like, are, do you trade like warrior trading? Um, so first of all, he's long biased. <clears throat> I do not care. Um, I've now um, really started to um, head more into the the shorting side of it. I don't think he's ever shorted. Um, and he, he's more of a scalper micro trader. I, I'd say the main difference with us is price target difference. I've more aggressive price targets. Um, and so because of that, our strategies are a decent amount different. I know all of Ross Cameron's courses and, and learning material. I've learned some stuff from him for sure. I think he's a guy that's probably worth watching. He's a 10 year veteran, I'm not. Um, but our strategies are a, a very different in a lot of areas. The The only similar, similar, similarity, hold crap, between Ross Cameron and I is, is we have um, same parameters on some of the stuff we trade. So on volume, float, things like that. So I learned a lot from him. He's uh, he's definitely knowledgeable and use him as a resource. I would, he's one of the three traders I'd probably only ever recommend. If I'm into trading, any hitting, we short and trade Tesla. I used to. So, Jared, I, I used to. Um, but that was back when I only long traded penny stocks. Now that I have both tools in my arsenal, I, I traded Tesla for like a whole summer, just that. And I did pretty good on it. I had, you know, a few thousand dollar days, but I was trading with like half a million dollars. I was using a lot of leverage. Um, and I learned that it really wasn't worth it for some instances. Um I don't foresee myself ever doing that again. But it was definitely a fun summer, and I definitely made a decent amount of money on it. Uh, I think the most I ever made on Tesla in a day was like five or 8000 Um I can't say I'll never do it again, but there, there were some things I learned that summer. Um, but, yeah, before pre-split, so I was trading at $1,000. I was trading at $1,000, and I'd buy 100 to 300 share positions. Never full port? No, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, I want to be careful on these Q&As to say like full port guys because a lot of you guys um, generally if you're in here you don't have a few years of profitability under your belt um, you know I mean I'll, I'm, I'm straight up when I was trading with sub 25k I mean my small account challenge I was using full account plus leverage I mean there you go I, I did it I've done it um, I mean, I was I can't double my account in a month without using practically my full account. So I'm not gonna tell you you can't full port. It's about your confidence. How is mass trading taxed? That's my number one percent fear. If you made 85k and lost lost out of 14k, do you not pay taxes? Assume you know. So um, this is really cool. And I actually my accountant is day trading certified. One of the I think there's less than 100 certified day trading accountants in the U.S. and he's awesome. Uh, you actually can do some wash sales, uh, believe it or not, uh, if you trade under your LLC. Not if you're an independent trader, you can't. I if I traded under my LLC uh, and I registered as a actual legal day trader with the IRS, I would have had. I, and I just had this meeting a few months ago. Half a million dollars in tax write-offs from wash sales, believe it or not. Half a million. It's a lot of write-offs. 
So I, I, my, my pants were brown walking out, and they were white walking in. So you do the math. Um, so what I would tell you, and in the, the, I think people are get so scared about taxes. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what my accountant told me when I went to him when I was 17. I challenge you to make money doing it first, then worry about taxes. Make money first, then 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 come to talk about doing taxes. If you have a year of profitability in your belt and you made money, okay, cool. I mean, yes, you're going to get taxed heavily, but why don't you make money first and then you can worry about taxes? I would challenge you to do that. I'd, I'd forget about it, especially if you're first starting, forget about taxes completely. Focus on learning how to make money and how to actually profitably trade. And then once you have that down, then you should learn about taxes. But one step at a time. You can't be a tax genius um, and be scared to get taxed on the money if you never make money. It's just the fact of the matter. Um, that's just what he told me, and I and I second that advice. I second that advice in all business, honestly. Um, and that might not be advice that other accounts would give you, but focus on the business profiting first. That's the most important thing. So you have money to tax. Is it normal that I've been uh, only losing for more than a year now? I mean, my losers are bigger than my winners. So, um, no, I mean, I honestly didn't see a massive jump in profitability until probably my second and a half, sec second year in. But you have to understand, I was doing everything on my own. Um, I had zero guidance in trading. So, if you, if your second heading into your third year, I really think um, you should start to turn the corner on profitability. But the biggest thing is, what are you doing um, after your first year that is helping you with trading? Do you know your numbers? Can I, can I sit here and say, what's your average winner and your average loser? What's your win percentage? And I can just start going in those. If you had Tradezilla or Kinfo, Kinfo is free. It, or Tradezilla is $33 a month. Best investment you'll make. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. And if you send me your broker statements, you know, app, you know, after using Kinfo or Tradezilla, I can tell you exactly what you're doing wrong and then just pinpoint accuracy. Okay, so my biggest problem is my losers are bigger than my winners. Well, then the problem is what are the setups you're trading? One. And two, what's your risk management look like? What do your winning ratios look like? And then I could start to see some live examples um but yeah i i mean i'm not gonna sit here and tell you my first year was red because it wasn't um i actually ended green my first year so i however i can also sit here and tell you i mean you're down more more than 7k i w at one point was down more than 10 times that and i was 17 so i i know the feeling i know the feeling i understand that um it takes a long time um, I can, I can sit here and ask you a ton of questions. Like how are you reading level two accurately? Are you using it? Are you just staring at the charts? Are you just staring at your P and L? There's just so many variables within like, why are you losing? Um, I'd really have to sit down and be like, okay, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing right. Okay. Good questions, guys. Um, keep them coming. Uh, trading for a living, learn what it takes to become a full-time trader, including the challenges and rewards making a living from trading. Good question. So would I recommend cutting everything day trading for a living um, off rip? Answer, simple answer is no, absolutely not. Even when I was making money trading, I always had passive income because I either had a job or I had real estate. Sorry, my dad's calling me. Um, I had either two. In even at eighteen, I had four units under my belt, paying me passively several thousand. It was like two thousand a month, um, and I I was able to live off that. Um, so I don't see Gomez's question. Oh, uh, how do you know when a halt is close? That's a good one. Let's go over that. So let, let me let me focus on this question first. So would I recommend day trading for a full-time job off rep? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. You always, always should have another source of income other than trading 
So to make sure and to guarantee your bills are paid, I've been in the problem of just having trading as my only source of income. And if I had a bad month, my credit card statements weren't paid. If I had this, it, nothing was paid. So all, even now, I always have other sources of income. Understanding that it's either um, about business. I have, I have businesses that are making me money. I have investments that are making me money. Um, and you can sit here and say, oh, well, that's easy because you're a guru and you sell a program. I can show you my bank statements and show you. I have never taken a dollar from BC. I can actually show you. I invested last year in the beginning of it over $50,000. Profit count wasn't free, yo, um, into the company, and I still haven't taken any benefits from it. So it's other things outside of PC. Mainly it was real estate growing up, um, and then I did some awesome um, angel investments, and I parked my money in the right areas um, at, a, at an early age. So having an even part-time job, is is vitally important for trading especially you know after you have say two years of profitability and you've made i don't know six figures in trading then you can be like okay but at that point you still should be taking that money and reinvesting it i promise you you will be a way better trader if you have passive income coming in way better so how do i know when a halt level is close that's an excellent question and if i go to today's trade recap i'm going to show you and then we're going to wrap up with a few more questions. Um, Jared is a perfect example. I yep, Fidlin Tomcat. He's a master. He's part of our mastermind, um, and he was working a full time job. However, and this is why, and this is why, when someone's like, "I'm too busy," or "I can't trade because this, this, and this," I now have a person I could tell you. BS, you have zero excuses. Zero. Because Jared worked as much as I did, 60, 80 hours a week, traveled far away from his family, could and, and was on job sites, and had a family, has a family, has a mortgage, has everything, and he's still making it work. He's changing his life because he went from working a full-time job for a company. Now he's like, you know what? Trading is a passion of mine, and I want to do it. Only possibility, I'm starting my own company. And so now he's in that area of, of transitioning to his own company and he's growing it and he's making income from that and he's going to hopefully in a year or so have availability to trade um, as well. So no one could tell me, now no one could tell me that they can't because you can change your life. And I'm a firm believer in that. Um, so, Ag okay, Agba trade was, was today. So Agba... Today's trade. This is live. Okay. You can see my PL. You can see I was up over 2K on it. Now, before a stock is. How do I know if a stock is going to get halted? Easy. It is called L U L D levels. Level up, level down. These are circuit breaker halts that are very common in trading. Now, Thinkorswim does not provide LULD levels for you. You have to find external brokers and level twos that do. Um, Lightspeed provides it. Trade Zero provides it. Hammer provides it. It's is a must for momentum trading. So this is the trade I took today, and I could see that the stock was starting to stall out at the halt level. You can see on my screen LULD 468. Okay, so this was approaching halt level. I sized into it because I wanted to get stuck in the halt. And when we know about halts, generally they resume they resume way higher. Okay, so look look what happened here. Or here's a, here's an awesome thing. Stocks also generally top out close to halt levels. It has to tap and hold the halt level for a serious amount of time, not just tap at once. I take half profits or I take some profits into halt levels in case of a rejection, which it almost happened here. So taps halt level. Actually, I could, I could rewind a little bit. So taps it here. I take half profit. Boom. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Right here, it taps it. Got to go back. So taps it right here. I take half profit. Okay. And then, and then it comes back down because it didn't hold that LULD level. Now, I, I saw the buy order, so I'm like, okay, this is going to retest. Off the retest, boom, it's halted. Um, and that's how I was able to tell where the halt level was at from my level two, called the LULD levels. Very, very important for trading. 
And then just so you all know, I end that trade. Bada bing, bada boom. 25 hundo. And, you know, like I talk about, you know, why, why this, why that. Um, I could dissect this trade, but it's time for, that's, that's for another day. This is for next Thursday's trade review with the PC team. Mobile trading is hard, extremely hard. My win percentage drops instantly. That's a good question. And we'll, we might wrap up with this. If you guys have some last minute questions, you can ask them. So top, I was, I was trading or I was golfing last night and top decided to run after hours. I saw it on my phone at one at hundred dollars. I saw it on my phone at 150. I saw it on my phone at 200. Why didn't I trade top yesterday? Well, I know because I know my numbers. My win percentage, if I'm trading on my phone, instantly drops 20 to 25 percent. I tried it. I tried trading my phone for a while just to see just to see what it looked like, and it dropped 20 to 25 percent. Why is that? Why is trading on a mobile phone? One second. Why is trading on a mobile phone harder than trading on a desktop? And this is why I, I don't really recommend it. Is because of two things. One, order execution. Or execution number one. You know how hard and how long it takes to click buy, 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 buy on your phone? You know, and all the confirmation orders, boom, 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 boom. It takes a long time. Not to mention, these phones are not optimized for day trading. It will not fill you at the desired price point. A desktop application will. Okay. Number two. You mean to tell me you can see level two plus charts while watching the phone as well as having your hand over the sell button? Find that hard to believe. Moo moo, maybe. TOS, absolutely not. These two things, if you are trying to trade like I am momentum stocks, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, you will not succeed. Okay, over the long period of time. I can try it. I'll try it. I'm, I'm going to do a challenge this summer if I, if I can do it. Maybe. But at best, I bet you I'm break even. Because think about how long it takes you to stop out of your trade. For me, I see my level two, I see my charts. The second anything goes wrong, click. I'm out. How long is it going to take you? Oh man, the chart looks doesn't look good. Let me check the level two. Oh man, level two doesn't look good. Okay, uh, sell, full market, full order, review, submit, trade, boom. By that time, stock's down 10%. Okay, from where I sold. It is extremely hard. These two things are going to make it nearly impossible for you to profit. If you're still trading on your phone, still, tra still trading momentum stocks, good luck. That's, that's all I got to say. Especially if you're trying to copy me, because I'm already in before my voice even says it. My brain moves faster than my mouth. It's just a fact of the matter, which I wish my brain moved a little bit faster because I would maybe not some, say some things I wish I didn't say. Um. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Any other questions before I head out? 